Now, it's my great pleasure today to introduce Aviation Week's 2011 Person of the Year. And you've all seen the magazine, and now you see the man himself. So, Louie, we're very happy to have you here. And for those of you that don't know, Louie is chairman and CEO of United Technologies. He joined the UTC subsidiary Pratt & Whitney in 1993 and was president from 99 to 2006. He then became president and chief operating officer and a director of UTC, becoming CEO in 2008 and chairman in 2010. Prior to joining Pratt, he was with General Motors in Canada for 14 years. He received a Bachelor of Commerce degree in production management from the University of Montreal. Louis serves as Vice Chairman of the Business Council. He's a member of the Board of Cargill and a Chairman of the Yale Cancer Center and Advisory Board. And he's also a very important member of the Congressional Medal of Honor Foundation, which I have the pleasure and honor of co-chairing. And I will tell you that of all the members we have, Louis and UTC have probably made with Lockheed and a couple of others, including Boeing, the most significant contributions. They helped us with our website. And Louis, I want to thank you on behalf of that board for all you've done. So it's a great pleasure and an honor for me to introduce Louis, who was inducted as a fellow of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Please welcome Louis Chenever to our club. Thank you, Louis. Well, Bruce, thank you so much for the uh, very warm introduction. It's, uh, it's certainly an honor to be here today uh, as we start the new year. Uh, it's also great to see uh, so many good friends, colleagues, as well as partners. I mean, this is a very tight industry. This is a very important industry. And it's got very sp special relationship amongst the people. I think it's also appropriate for me to recognize and thank all the UTC customers that are here today. We're certainly grateful uh, for the trust you've placed in us in the past, and we're committed to supporting your success and delivering additional value in the years ahead. Certainly before I get started, like, like Bruce did, uh, I'd like to acknowledge and thank all the men and women uh, who have fought and continue to fight for our freedom. We should never take our freedom for granted, nor should we take for granted the brave men and women who fight every day to secure it. Also to the veterans here today. Also to the veterans here today, I thank you for your great service to our nation. And I assure you that UTC and myself and the entire aerospace industry recognizes and appreciates all the sacrifices you've done. I know 2012 marks the 70th year anniversary for the Wings Club. So let me compliment the officers uh, and members of the Wing Club, which for seven decades of supporting this great aerospace industry by providing a great forum for industry leaders to exchange ideas and by encouraging young people to pursue careers in this great industry. You know, I look back at 2011, it was a good year for UTC particularly uh, to our aerospace businesses. We had tremendous success uh, with our geared turbofan engine, which I'll talk about, obviously, uh, in a couple minutes. We also announced two transformational deals, i.e. acquisition as well as Goodrich. And you know, during the reception before lunch, a number of people asked me about uh, Goodrich acquisition. So maybe I'll just say a couple of words here, which is, uh, it's been uh, almost four months since we announced uh, the agreement. The more I learn about Goodrich, the more I like it. Uh, they have a great uh, technology. They have great passionate people like this industry tends to have. Uh, it really complements our existing portfolio. And I really look forward to welcoming the Goodrich people in the UTC family in the near future and executing our integration plan to deliver additional value for our customers and shareholders is really the focus that my senior leadership team has as we move forward. Now, turning to the outlook for aviation aerospace industry, uh, it's hard to come here and not talk a bit about what's going on. Overall, I'd say I'm very optimistic 
as we begin 2012. Now, for sure, the global economy continues to look very challenging, especially in developed markets. Uh, but emerging markets continue to really grow uh, and present great opportunities for all of us, in my view. I think we're at a good time in the aerospace uh, cycle. Uh, and I expect certainly RPM rates will continue to grow at a much faster pace than the GTB, GDP growth. And that's because people want to connect together and traveling is important to uh, the globe. But rather than talk about the economic outlook today, uh, I'd like to highlight some of the challenges uh, that I know are so near and dear to your hearts uh, for our industry. You know, often I come to New York and I meet uh, with our large institu institutional investors and uh, Wall Street analysts. You know, one of the most challenging uh, part of these discussions is always to get investors to take a long-term view, uh, to get them to look back, uh, not just at the last few quarters, but to see how long-term value will be created by investment in technology long-term, because this is what is the foundation of our great industry. So, obviously, it's a pleasure for me today to speak with all of you, because I know there are a few topics that interest this group more than innovation, which has been really the key driver for our industry since its inception more than a century ago. One thing that makes our industry unique is the type of innovation that we do. If you think about it, in most cases, we innovate in an environment where failure is not an option. We're also not a million products a year. Rather, our products are developed sometime over long periods of time and they are going to be in service for several decades. They're highly complex, perhaps far more complex than the products many people would consider innovative, such as smartphones, such as computer tablets. I mean, those are great products, but if you look at what we do with our industry, it is pretty remarkable. We're working in an industry where we're driven by large, complex engineering projects and attracting people who have a great deal of discipline Courage and passion for what they do is key to our success. And certainly the Wings Club is a great organization because it brings together many of these people, people who have helped shape, and more importantly, will continue to shape modern aviation in ways we could barely imagine today. The opportunities for innovation in our industry are truly limitless. This becomes obvious when you look back at the advancement that occurred since the Winx Club got started back in the 40s. Back then, if you think about it, biplanes were still widely operated and retractable gear was considered cutting edge technology. Needless to say, we've made some pr great progress since. So this afternoon, I'd like to talk about some of the great innovation and technology development that is happening today in our company. But before I do, I want to talk briefly about some of the challenges I see facing our industry, especially the challenges standing in the way of innovation. I think we all agree innovation is a positive force around the world. It supports economic growth and prosperity and has the potential to dramatically change the world for the better. In fact, when you look at the most significant Turning points in world history, innovation has always played a critical role. Whether it was the steam engine driving industrial revolution or the way transistors revolutionized the field of electronics, paving the way for the modern computing IT revolution that's occurred in the second part of the 20th century. We've all seen great technology advances in our lifetimes, but we need to recognize that future innovation should not be taken for granted, innovation does not just happen. Rather, it depends on the right balance of three critical factors. The first one is visionary leadership that creates a culture of innovation, an environment where conventional thinking can be challenged and calculated risks can be taken. But bull vision on its own, it's not enough Innovation also requires private industry and government to support and fund ongoing R&D. This is absolutely critical to driving future innovation. The third factor 
is the ability to inspire and educate young people to sustain the pipeline of talent that is required for the future. You know, today the need for innovation has never been greater, as there are powerful forces that are fundamentally reshaping the world, including globalization and urbanization. And while we don't have enough time this afternoon to get into full discussions on some of these topics, I'd, I'd just like to say that it's really hard to overstate the impact these forces will have on our industry as we move forward. I'll give you an example that illustrates my point. Today, the world is urbanizing at a rate that we've never seen before. As we start 2012, more than 50% of the world's inhabitants live in cities. And some of these cities are growing into mega cities with populations that are in excess of 10 million people. Today, there are 21 of these mega cities. This is remarkable when you think that if you go back to 1975, there was only three of those large cities with population over 10 million people. Just a few more numbers today. There are around 380 cities globally that have population between 1 and 5 million people. This number will increase to over 500 by 2025. A lot of this growth will happen in emerging markets. By 2020, China alone will have more than 200 of these cities. Simply put, urbanization will be a powerful force for the next decade or two, creating an amazing opportunity to build better cities and better aircraft, cities and aircraft that are more efficient, consume less energy, and have a smaller impact on the environment. However, this can only be achieved with the right focus by industry and government on energy efficiency and commitment to fund the research necessary to develop these game-changing technologies. You know, in the past, our industry has shown that with the right leadership, the best and brightest young minds and sufficient R&D funding, there are few limits to what is possible. Just one example from my company is our Pratt & Whitney Gear turbofan. With this engine that's going to enter service next year, we'll deliver a remarkable 16% better fuel burn, impacting customer economics. We'll also deliver double-digit improvement in nitrous oxide. We'll also reduce airport footprint noise by 50%. And we believe this is just the beginning. And I'm proud today that we have some of the most senior Leaders that are here, Dave S., who's president of Pratt, and Mike Dumais, who's leading Hamilton Sunstrand, two of our key aerospace division. And they're at the forefront of making sure that we invest in these technology and bring them to life to create the value for our end customers. The GTF story, if you think about it, really began uh, in, the late, in the late 80s, about. Uh, back then, a small group of engineers at Pratt & Whitney uh, became convinced that major reductions in fuel burn Operating costs, noise, and emission could be achieved in jet engine. By really leveraging the benefit of geared technology used on smaller turboprop planes. We had looked at several new engine architecture, but in you know the analysis it soon became clear that the geared approach had the most potential. We already knew the turboprop was incredibly efficient way to produce power. The reason we knew this is because we had a small engine division, Pratt Canada, that was supporting the industry of turboprops. In the most basic terms, we knew that if we could make the next generation jet engine like a turboprop, where the fan moved more slowly because of the gear, we wouldn't penalize the turbine in the back of the engine, and we could take better advantage of airflow in order to make a quieter, more efficient engine. We also wouldn't have to trade off engine efficiency against noise, which would have been the case with other architectures. Now, I won't go into detail about the many gear configuration that we examined and what we learn after investing in tree demonstrator, demonstrator engine. But what I will say is after supporting R&D effort, almost a billion dollar in research development, and as I was leaving Pratt back in 06 to transfer to the corporate office as the CEO, my confidence in the gear was exceptional based on what I had learned. And in 06, after becoming UTC COO, George David supported 
the initiative, and we decided we're going to make a big investment in technology for the single aisle market. Why the single aisle? Well, it's simple. A single aisle represents 75% of volume of all our planes sold. So, what happens after that is we publicly announced we were building a gear turbofan demonstrator. I would say it's fair to say we had some critics. Many said it would never work. Some of the competitors said the gear system wasn't durable. Some industry analysts call the gear old technology. It's also important to remember that when we launched the GTF program, that there were no airplanes being built for this engine. And there were no customers committed to the program. So at this stage, we're all alone, which really made this decision unique. You got a billion in, and if you're gonna move forward, you're talking about four or five billion dollars yet to go to bring it to market on different platforms. Of course, decisions like this really come down to what you believe and what type of company you want to be. At Pratt & Whitney, the passion over the gear turbofan was impossible to ignore. We had a growing group of true believers, but naturally we had to make sure engineering worked and that cost benefits would add up so that our customers would be delighted. A big driver in making the number uh, work for the GTF was the fact that we could use this common architecture and basically scale the engine for different platforms like C-Series, the MRJ, the NEO. Plus, we gave ourselves a core to do a large business aircraft, long-range aircraft. And that's why the business case works on those. It's also important to note that even though we didn't have a committed customer to the GTF, our customers were very much a part of the process. As we began to define and mature GTF technologies, we visited with over 150 customers to validate our approach. Throughout the development process, we held annual GTF symposiums with our airline customers, established a GTF steering committee, and I know many of you were part of this in this room. These mechanisms allowed us to obtain and incorporate customer feedback through the process. I always remember I was in Palm Beach on static tests, and we invited a group of customers and that day I smiled because after showing the demo, one of the customers says, could we see the engine run at, run at full power? It'd be nice to see it at takeoff power. I said, it is right now. He says, I can't believe it's that quiet. To me, that was the, the best thing that ever happened for customers to realize the game-changing technology. Now, at UTC, we certainly understand that our success is dependent upon our customers' success. So it's critical to have this early customer buy-in and customer feedback. I know several members of the GTF, as I said earlier, uh, subcommittee are here today, and I thank you for all the input and for all you did to help us bring this technology home. In the end, we felt confident in challenging conventional thinking about engine architecture, in part because we could leverage more than half a billion hours from PwC's turboprop expertise into this next generation of jet engine. We also understood that in today's global economy, our greatest chance for success would come from launching a disruptive technology that was fundamentally better than what the competition was doing at the time. An engine that set new benchmarks for environment performance, for efficiency, as well as for emission. And we know that noise is becoming a more and more important factor as we move forward, as well as driving uh, cost reduction so that the business model of airlines could operate even better. We truly believe that the size of the potential benefit for both our company and our customers justified the calculated risk rather than the safer approach of basically incremental change. Now, honestly, I look at it today with more than 2,000 engines on order in just the last 12 months. We're confident we made the right decision, and we expect that the gear turbofan will be every bit as important to our industry, and maybe even more important to the future of Pratt & Whitney than was the legendary J57 that won the Collier Trophy back in 52. That was the beginning of the jet era. That became the JT3D on the 707, the Douglas DC-8. And I'm convinced that moving forward, we're going to see a lot of momentum. The same holds true for the development of, if you look at what we did last year also with the X2 technology a demonstrator, we demonstrated 250 knots of forward flight and won the Collier Trophy last year for that. 
Today we continue to develop the technology with what we call the S-97 Raider program. It's a prototype light tactical helicopter that leverages the X-2 platform. Now, in addition to much greater speed and improved noise, the S-97 will provide increased maneuverability, reduce the pilot workload, greater endurance. It's going to also improve the ability to operate at very high altitude and tough terrain. So to me, this is truly game changing. And while I have great confidence in the X-2 and gear technology, uh, honestly, I look at the future and there's so many opportunities. I will say I'm also a bit troubled uh, by the outlook for the future a pool of U.S. workers that we have in the era of science and math, technology, engineering scale, which could be a big impact on our ability to impact the innovation in the industry going forward. This circles back really to my earlier point about future innovation that is so dependent on the ability to inspire and educate young generation. You know, based on the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the number of technology-oriented jobs is expected to increase over the next decade. That's a good thing. But overall, the number of trained and qualified engineers continues to decline. Today, only about 6% of U.S. college degrees are awarded in engineering. And that compares to, in Germany, it's about 16%. In Japan, it's 20%. And in emerging marketplace like China, 33% of college grads are engineers. So in the US, more students are earning degrees in psychology rather than engineering. And there's also more degrees being earned in performing arts than physical science. These numbers are troubling, especially when you consider that innovation has been the cornerstone of economic growth throughout our nation's history. As industry leaders, it's our job to develop the generations that will follow us, especially since we will all have an enormous stake in finding highly skilled workers to drive the innovation that's mapped out for our industry. Now, I know that many of the companies represented in this room today have been leading voices encouraging STEM education initiative in schools across the country. I absolutely applaud your efforts and encourage you to keep finding ways to inspire the young generation about careers in aerospace. Of course, this starts with providing additional opportunities for students to interact with aerospace professional and make sure they consider aerospace jobs. I know on that topic, the Wings Club has a great history of encouraging students to pursue careers in aviation. I also applaud the Wings Club for its student table. I met uh, the young people uh, at the back before. I was encouraged. I wish I was their age. I could start all over again. Uh, they got an exciting future ahead. Uh, so I welcome the uh, students from Aviation High School who are here today uh, for the lunch. I want you and your classmates to know aerospace engineers and scientists like those working on our GTF or X2 or S97 radar technology or other big projects in the uh, customer companies that we serve, not only have great benefits, but it's really exciting work. What we do is difficult, but a lot of fun, and the projects that really can change the future of the planet, in my view. So I could talk a lot more, but I'd like to close my remarks today by going back to one of the critical factors that is necessary to support future innovation. This is really the willingness of our government to fund and support R&D. As we all know, much of the discussion in Washington today is focused on reducing spending. And in times like these, it's important to take a long-term view and to remember that what a powerful contribution aerospace and defense industry is to the American economy. Our industry supports millions of high-skilled jobs, well-paying jobs, and it's amongst America's largest export opportunity. It has been and it will be. Past investment in aerospace and defense have played a vital role in safeguarding our national security, supporting humanitarian efforts around the globe, and spurring innovation that have enabled economic growth. While America's future requires finding the right budget solutions, it would be unwise to try to solve these challenges on the back of the defense and aerospace industry. The consequences, in my view, would be very severe. 
So, going forward, cutting too deeply into our defense budget would jeopardize our national and economic security and impact our future competitiveness as a global industry. So, let me end today by saying that I see a lot of amazing opportunities for our industry. While I spend much of my time talking about innovation in jet engines and helicopter, I see innovation happening throughout our industry. I could have talked about whether it's the 787, whether it's the C-Series or the JSF or many of the nice new business aircraft coming out. So there's innovation all across the industry. You know, I look at what the airlines do. Uh, I know airlines are listening as well to their customers and innovating in ways that make air travel more convenient for people and more enjoyable. They offer wireless and flight entertainment. They offer passengers the opportunity to do the boarding passes that are downloaded through their mobile phones. I mean, there's, think about what the industry is today versus what it was just five years ago versus what it was 20 years ago. It's amazing. And the pace is accelerating. So I hope this spirit of innovation that has defined our industry continues and that all of us have the foresight to see investment in innovation as the engine that will really power our future. And for that, I thank you very much. I also want to thank this opportunity. I got my wife. It's rare that she joins me for events like this. She's been a great partner for 30 plus years. Uh, obviously, when you're so intense doing what you do at work, you need a great partner, and she's been. Thank you, Debbie. On that, thank you very much, Bruce. You want to take me off stage, okay? Thank you. I know I speak for all of us. Thank you very much, Louis, for that excellent presentation. And I'd like to uh, present a gift to you at this point. I get a gift? Right here. Really? This is in recognition of the speech you gave today. It says, presented to Louis Chenever in grateful appreciation for your presentation at the Aviation Leader Series of the Wings Club, New York City, January 2012. Thank you again. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. Thank you very much.